A Call to Separation by Arthur Pink Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and the devil? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? 2 Corinthians 6, 14-16 This passage gives utterance to a divine exhortation for those belonging to Christ, to hold aloof from all intimate associations with the ungodly. It expressly forbids them entering into alliances with the unconverted. It definitely prohibits the children of God walking arm in arm with worldlings. It is an admonition applying to every phase and department of our lives, religious, domestic, social, commercial. And never, perhaps, was there a time when it more needed pressing on Christians than now. The days in which we are living are marked by the spirit of compromise. On every side we behold unholy mixtures, ungodly alliances, unequal yokes. Many professing Christians appear to be trying how near to the world they may walk, and yet go to heaven. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. This is a call to godly separation. In each dispensation, this divine demand has been made. To Abraham, Jehovah's peremptory word was, Get out of your country, and from your kindred, and from your father's house. To Israel, he said, So do not act like the people in Egypt, where you used to live, or like the people of Canaan, where I am taking you. You must not imitate their way of life. You must obey all my regulations and be careful to keep my laws. For I, the Lord, am your God. Leviticus 18, 3-4 And again, do not live by the customs of the people whom I will expel before you. It is because they do these terrible things that I detest them so much. Leviticus 20.23 It was for their disregard of these very prohibitions that Israel brought down upon themselves such severe chastisements. At the beginning of the New Testament we are shown the forerunner of Christ standing outside the organized religion of his day calling on men to flee from the wrath to come. The Savior announced that He calls His own sheep by name and leads them out. John 10.3 On the day of Pentecost, the word to believers was, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. Acts 2.40 Later, to the Christian Hebrews, Paul wrote, Let us go forth therefore unto Him, outside the camp. 13.13 God's call to his people in Babylon is, Come out of her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. Revelation 18.4 Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. This is God's word unto his people today, nor does it stand alone. In Romans 16.17 it is said, Mark those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. In 2 Timothy 2.20 we read, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. 2 Timothy 3.5 speaks of those, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Then it is added, From such turn away. What a word is that in Second Thessalonians 3.14. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him. How radical is the admonition of 1 Corinthians 5.11. Quote, I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat, unquote. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. We are fully persuaded that it is disregard of this commandment 
for a command it is, which is largely responsible for the low state which now prevails so generally among Christians, both individually and corporately. No wonder the spiritual pulse of many churches beats so feebly. No wonder their prayer meetings are so thinly attended. Christians who are unequally yoked have no heart for prayer. Disobedience at this point is a certain preventative to real and wholehearted devotion to Christ. No one can be an unshackled follower of the Lord Jesus, who is, in any way, yoked to his enemies. He may be a truly saved person, but the testimony of his life, the witness his walk, will not honor and glorify Christ. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. This applies first to our religious connections. How many Christians are members of so-called churches, where much is going on which they know is at direct variance with the Word of God? Either the teaching from the pulpit, the worldly attractions used to draw the ungodly, and the worldly methods employed to finance it, or the constant receiving into its membership of those who give no evidence of having been born again. Believers in Christ who remain in such, quote, churches, unquote, are dishonoring their Lord. Should they answer, quote, practically all the churches are the same, and were we to resign, what could we do? We must go somewhere on Sundays, unquote. Such language would show they are putting their own interests before the glory of Christ. Better stay at home and read God's word than fellowship with that which his word condemns. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. This applies to membership in secret orders. A yoke is that which unites. Those who belong to a lodge are united in solemn oath and covenant with their, quote, brother, unquote, members. Many of their fellow members give no evidence of being born again. They may believe in a supreme being, but what love have they for God's word? What is their relation to God's Son? Can two walk together, unless they are agreed? Amos 3.3 3. Can those who owe their all to Christ, both for time and eternity, have fellowship with those who despise and reject Him? Let any Christian reader who is thus unequally yoked get from under it without delay. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This applies to marriage. There are but two families in this world the children of God and the children of the devil. 1 John 3.10 If, then, a daughter of God marries a son of the devil, she becomes a daughter-in-law to Satan. If a son of God marries a daughter of Satan, he becomes a son-in-law to the devil. By such an infamous step, an affinity is formed between one belonging to the Most High God and one belonging to his archenemy. Strong language. Quote unquote. Yes, but not too strong. And oh, the bitter reaping from such a sowing. In every case, it is the poor Christian who suffers. Read the inspired histories of Samson, Solomon, and Ahab, and see what followed their unholy alliance in wedlock. As well might an athlete, who attached to himself a heavy weight, expect to win a race. As a Christian to progress spiritually by marrying a worldling. Oh, what watchfulness and prayer is needed in the regulation of our affections. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. This applies to business partnerships. Disobedience at this point has wrecked many a Christian's testimony and pierced him through with many sorrows. Whatever may be gained of this world by seeking its avenues to wealth and social prestige will but poorly compensate for the loss of fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Read Proverbs 1.10-14. through 14. The path which the disciple of Christ is called to tread is a narrow one, and if he leaves it for a wider road, it will mean severe chastenings, heartbreaking losses, and perhaps the forfeiting, the Savior's, quote, well done, unquote, at the end of the journey. We are to hate even the garment, a figure of habits and ways, spotted by the flesh, Jude 23, and are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world, James 127. What a searching and sweeping word is that in Second Corinthians 7, 1. 
Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If any occupation or association is found to hinder our communion with God, or our enjoyment of spiritual things, then it must be abandoned. Beware of, quote, leprosy, unquote, in the garment, Leviticus 13.47. Anything in my habits or ways which mars happy fellowship with the brethren, or robs me of power and service, is to be unsparingly judged and made an end of. Burned, Leviticus 13.52. Whatever I cannot do for God's glory must be avoided. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and the devil? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What union can there be between God's temple and idols? How explicit and emphatic are the terms used there? No excuse whatever is there for failing to understand the terms of this exhortation and the reason with which it is supported. This command is so plain that it requires no interpreter. All unions, alliances, partnerships, entanglements with unbelievers are expressly forbidden to the Christian. It is impossible to find within the whole range of Holy Scripture plainer language on any subject than we have here. Righteousness and wickedness, light and darkness, Christ and the devil, God's temple and idols, what do they have in common? What bond is there between them? The contrasts presented are very pointed and searching. Righteousness is right doing. Wickedness is wrong doing. The unerring and only standard of right doing is the word of righteousness. Hebrews 5.13 By this alone is the Christian's life and walk to be regulated. But the worldling disregards and defies it. Then what fellowship can there be between one who is in subjection to God's word with one who is not? Light and darkness. God is light, 1 John 1, 5. And his saints are the children of light, Luke 16, 8. But the children of the wicked one are darkness, Ephesians 5, 8. What communion, then, can there be between members of families so dissimilar? Christ and the devil... What concord can there be between one to whom Christ is everything and one who despises and rejects him? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. How blessed is this! First, we have the exhortation given. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Second, the reason adduced. For what fellowship has righteousness with wickedness? Third, the inducement offered, 2 Corinthians 6, 16-17. This is a divine promise, and it is striking to note that it is a sevenfold promise. 1. I will live in them. 2. I will walk among them. 3. I will be their God. 4. They shall be my people. 5. I will welcome you. 6. I will be your father. 7. You will be my sons and daughters. I will live in them is fellowship. I will walk among them is companionship. I will be their God is relationship. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31 They shall be my people is ownership acknowledged as his. I will welcome you means being brought to the place of experimental and conscious nearness to God. I will be your father, means I will manifest myself to you in this character, impart to your hearts all the joys of such. You will be my sons and daughters, means that such godly separation from the world will afford demonstration that we are his sons and daughters. Compare Matthew 5.44 says the Lord Almighty, this is the only time the divine title Almighty is found in all the 21 epistles of the New Testament. It seems to be brought in here for the purpose of emphasizing the sufficiency of our resource. As another has said, 
let any Christian act on the command of separation given in 2 Corinthians 6, 14-17, and he will find his path so beset with difficulties and so tending to arouse the hostility of all, that if his eyes are not kept fixed on the Almighty God, who has thus called him out, he will surely have a breakdown. But let it be noted that these promises are conditional, conditional on obeying the preceding exhortations. Yet if the heart lays hold of this blessed inducement, then obedience to the command will be easy and pleasant.'